Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hello all, it's April 29th and I'm just bringing you another update on one aspect of the current challenge. And there's a document released at the moment relating to vitamin D with a lot of kind of recommendations based on early data. So I put the link below, but uh, it's quite interesting. And it's from several doctors who've put together some of the trends relating to vitamin D and perhaps susceptibility to this challenge. So it's showing on the screen at the moment and they go through some supporting evidence for the importance of vitamin D in this whole scenario. And a couple of things they highlight, one of them is that coronavirus and influenza viruses have a long history of very strong seasonality, which has never fully been explained. It's been debated. And the severe outbreaks for the recent issue or the current ongoing issue are heavily focused on above 20 degrees latitude. So into the low kind of vitamin D availability uh, latitudes. Vitamin D deficiency, they call out, occurs primarily from a lack of exposure to the sun's UV rays, particularly in summer. Uh, so during the winter, when there's a lack of UV present, you get this big slump showing deficiency, generally in populations. So these are just circumstantial, though, to be quite fair. They note that Italy, very high latitude, has had the most severe outbreak and very high case fatality rate. So look at some of their points. Italy has one of the worst vitamin D deficiency rates in Europe. I actually wasn't aware of that, to be quite honest. Uh, a study of Italian women, they note, between 60 to 80 years of age, had enormous rates, 27% were below 5 nanogram. Now remember that below 30 nanogram was the level of risk in the recent study or two studies. So 30 nanogram is where you should be to be sufficient. So 27% of 60 to 80 year old women in Italy are below five nanogram. So that's profound deficiency. And lower than 12 nanogram, as many as 76% of women tested in this older age group were below 12, which again is pretty profoundly deficient. So they're interesting demographics. Another Italian study showed winter prevalence of hypovitaminosis D up to 32% of healthy postmenopausal women and up to 82% in patients who are engaged in neurorehabilitation and also, I think, in various care homes. So that's profound vitamin D deficiency in a, an astonishing percentage, to be quite honest. Now, Japan, they call out just as a logical comparator, very low severity of this current issue, and their latitude is high. However, they have got recovery rates in Japan around seven times higher than deaths. And in many of the European countries, you know, the ratios have been a lot worse. So they're just calling it out that it's high latitude, but it doesn't seem to have too much severity. But they also note that even with its high latitude, they have a strikingly low incidence of vitamin D deficiency versus Europe. And fish and some other factors are being considered here. Uh, but also we do know it's not just the sun, that a healthy lifestyle and living and low inflammation will result in a higher D status almost regardless. So, you know, there's quite a bit of confounding here, but it's a fair observation. And the prevalence of D below 12 in women over 30 years old in Japan is only 10%. So it's quite different than Europe and certainly Italy. And prevalence of vitamin D below 30 nanogram, right, in active el elderly in another study was below 5%. So in active elderly people, below 30 was at a very low level. So this is kind of quite, quite striking. And Europe, they note from many studies, generally lower than 10 nanogram or profoundly deficient was found in 2% to 30% of all adults. Okay, so it varies greatly between countries, but the percentage may increase to 75% with these profoundly low levels in more older persons and particularly institutions because of you know their diet and the way they're cared for and they don't really get out much. So 
these are all just comparisons, associations. They don't prove anything, but they're, they're fair observations, especially given the recent human vitamin D studies for this issue. Now, they also get into latitude and they note that, and I won't read this out here, but the severity of outbreaks have been strongly linked to latitude. And obviously the higher latitudes, you have lower vitamin D availability, even in the summer. So they show here in blue and with the red line there, the kind of current issue severity, and it's clearly concentrated. Now there's many other factors in these associations, so make no mistake about it. But still, it's very interesting given everything else we know uh, about the mechanisms of UV and vitamin D generation and many other diseases that correlate. So it's certainly worth noting. Equatorial regions, they pulled out a 2009 study from the pandemic back then. And it's important to note that this is a different virus, obviously, but it's to make a general point again. And it was a Brazil study. And noted there was that the severity was dramatically higher in deaths per 100,000 as you moved down to the lower UV latitudes. So there'll be other factors there, population densities and you know, dietary factors, etc. But it still shows trends that have been seen for the last century in terms of latitude and influenza type illnesses and severity of outcome. So it's worth noting and, and considering. Here's my kind of plot from 2014, which I featured the other day in a podcast on vitamin D. And again, you see that the UV areas high UV areas with lots of um, availability just happen to be the ones where there's very low severity seen for this issue and probably notable or most notable as a coincidence or an association is Australia and New Zealand have come out of a very hot summer so they're in the tail end of a very hot high UV summer um, and I was actually in New Zealand last November and I, I felt it. <laughs> I was out in the sun. So <clears throat> they would be people who would be relatively uh, very sufficient for the ones that did expose themselves over the past few months. Whereas the northern Europe, where a lot of the major impacts are, we've just come out of a long winter and we will be at our lowest ebb for vitamin D, generally speaking. So interesting. There have been lots of studies on this and also we see again and again the seasonality of influenza and coronavirus, previous versions, uh, the outbreaks. So very powerful uh, kind of seasonality and rise and fall. And it has been tied for many, many decades primarily to like vitamin D, but there's also other factors like weather and humidity, you know, so it's been debated over the decades. Uh, coronavirus has particularly displayed marked uh, winter seasonality between the months of December and April, and we're not detected in summer months. So, you know, it's a pretty strong pattern, but there could be other reasons for it. Here's the slide from 2014 in my vitamin D lecture, which, uh, I'll just show here and it's just one study of many where it looked at the patterns of vitamin D status of the population versus the rise and fall of the influenzas and again you get pretty dramatic uh, correlations but I will warn again that summer also has different weather and behaviors of people they're outdoors more and congregating outdoors perhaps more than indoors etc so there's other possibilities here. Uh, in terms of supplements, I was careful the other day to note that simply jacking up your vitamin D level through supplements may not in any way be the same as having a naturally high vitamin D through diet, lifestyle, low inflammation, uh, insulin sensitivity, and many other things. So I want to be careful there. But still, it's worth featuring this study I showed in 2014, one of the few human studies uh, carefully executed with supplementation. And as you can see there in the top left, yes, in the winter is where we see the infections. And there appeared to be, from the study, a quite dramatic difference between supplemented and non-supplemented people. So it indicates that supplementation may be a route towards as uh, benefits, uh, even though I would say that raising your D status through many routes together would be more um, important, shall we say.
So I'm going to go back to the recent human study in preprint uh, form and again just highlight that the normal or above 30 nanogram vitamin D status people had a dramatically lower uh, death rate for infection, even after correcting for age and comorbidity and sex, uh, than the people who are below a 30 or certainly below 20 nanogram. So very, very strong associational data. So we've got the guys and gals who are above 30. They are in a certain physiological state. It's not just D, but they are people defined by having a high D status. And they have around 10 times, it would appear, lower mortality than the people who are in the state of being below 20. And I went through as well reasons why you might be in this 30 nanogram or above group. And it would be high nutrient dense, uh, really good nutritional inputs over the previous years, particularly foods that are higher in D, in fairness. It will also be having insulin sensitivity or avoiding insulin resistant states uh, or leptin resistance. And this will, from the literature, result in you having a higher D status. You will be that type of person. If you avoid inflammatory states or chronic inflammatory conditions, even if they're subclinical, you'll also be much more likely to be in this group. And of course, the sun, which is what most of this podcast was about, was just looking at the sun. If you are higher in sun exposure, healthy sun exposure, you will, of course, uh, be more likely to be in this group. And we'll finish with the supplements because, yes, that will increase your D status, but may not confer all of the benefits that all of the aforementioned four things would um, lead to as well as higher D status. So I'm now going to finish with a philosophical question, as I often do. So we know from the studies recently, once the data bears out, that we've got this 10x risk difference for death or serious outcome from this current issue. And we know the people below 20 nanogram, however they got there, are in the really high risk group. We also know generally what puts you in the above 30 nanogram group. And we've listed out there the diet, insulin sensitivity, lack of inflammatory chronic diseases, etc. Also, we've got the sun, which figured highly in the earlier part of this pod. And, you know, supplements are going to raise your status too. So we know generally what puts you in the 30 nanogram group, broadly speaking. But what if we had moved the below 30 nanogram group into the above 30 nanogram through any or all of the measures that we're aware of. And what especially if we had moved the below 20 nanogram 10x death risk people over the past year, or even now, into the above 30 group? Would there be a huge reduction in the impacts of this issue? Perhaps. And that's a pretty interesting question to ponder. Um, not saying it would be easy, but it, it's an interesting question to ponder. What would be the tempo of the current crisis if we were able to achieve something like that? So, thanks for listening. And I will, again, as always, say that to support this free podcast, which has been free for a long time now, and a lot of talks released, a lot of data, and a lot of interpretation. Hope you appreciate it. But to keep it free, I'd really ask if you could go to extratimemovie.com. That's extratimemovie.com. And for $3.99 or $9.99 for download, you can stream, watch our new movie, which focuses on the biggest killer in the world, heart disease. So the current issue is very challenging, very tragic, but the numbers will be obviously tiny compared to heart disease and other modern chronic disease impacts which are going to keep going on all over the world so our movie looks at stopping and even reversing heart disease in uh, middle-aged people so it's a fascinating watch and gives you a good indication of the types of things to do which will include things like we're discussed during this podcast so really appreciate your support there and particularly if you could share the website 
and that would really help us and also help to get the message out to save lives. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.